Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. This week we're going to start uh, a brief look at the book of Joel. Joel is one of those tiny books that's known as the one of the minor prophets. There are 12 of them that come in the, uh, well they're the last 12 books of the Old Testament. But don't be fooled, just because they're known as minor prophets, that's really only because of the size of them rather than that their message is insignificant or trivial. And I hope we'll see as we look through this quite short book uh, just how powerful Joel's message is and how there's truth in here that applies to us today just as much as it did to the people who heard him. So uh, I've given you the clue as to where to find it. Don't be afraid to look in the index if you need to to find the page number. But the Minor Prophets are found uh, as the last 12 books of the Old Testament. So if you if you split your Bible in half, you'll come to Psalms. Uh, and then you'll come Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah is a big one. Then Jeremiah, quite a big one. And then it's Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Hosea is the first of the Minor Prophets. And then Joel is the second. So, once you've found it, let's read this chapter together. Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, this is a very dramatic uh, reading about uh, how locusts have come and stripped the land of everything. And Lord, Joel is writing about it because you have given him a message. This is your word to the people of the day, but also to us. So help us to understand it and to learn what it is that you would have us to know and to do and to be as a result of what's written here. We ask it in your name. Amen. Locusts, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a locust. I think most people have, probably uh, from their school days when uh, that was the first time I saw some locusts. And um, uh, we don't have them native to this country, but they're native to many parts of the world. And uh, they will swarm. And those swarms can be huge to the point now where there are people whose job is to watch out for the possibility of locusts swarming and to take preventative action before it happens. But of course there was no such thing in Joel's time. I was doing a little bit of homework uh, to learn about locust swarms. I'm told that in 1889 there was a swarm of locusts that covered 2,000 square miles. And every square mile, it was estimated, contained 120 million locusts. Just a few years earlier, in 1881, and this may have had some connection, uh, they found an egg mass that locusts had laid, and it weighed 1,300 tons. Imagine if all those had hatched. And locusts swarming, uh, they have uh, been seen even as far out to sea as 1,200 miles from the nearest shore as they go on a hunt to find food to eat. It is said that one locust laying its eggs in June can have 18 million living descendants by October. No wonder the people of Joel's time were afraid of what locusts might do. And Joel uh, talks about this invasion that's coming and he also goes on to talk about something else which we'll delve into in due course. We don't know much about Joel. All we know is he was called Joel and his father was Pethuel. The uh, theologians that have studied his writings have tried to work out when he was making his prophecy. And the, the figures that they come up with vary by something like 400 years. Some people uh, position the writing of Joel at one point in history some at another point in history. But because we only have the message that Joel comes to bring and there aren't any specific warnings to specific people that we can track and place in their position in history, it's open for debate as to when Joel was speaking. Does that matter? Actually, no, it doesn't. Because the message is more important than the man. Of course it would be nice to be able to fit it into some kind of historical context. But we don't need to. We need to ask God, what are you saying to me as we read through this passage? What I'd like you to do, uh, I'm going to put some questions up on the screen now. Uh, and I've worked out this week, uh, once I find my mouse, uh, that actually I can still talk over uh, the screen which I didn't realize wasn't happening last week so what I'd like you to do is to hit the pause button and look at these three questions write three headlines based on what happens in this chapter uh, what other little things can have a devastating effect on society and on my life and, and just like a locust swarm they might be little things that 
can become big things. But what can have a devastating effect on society and on my life? And then who is Joel actually speaking to? And what is he calling them to do? Hit the pause, come back to me when you're ready and we'll have a look at this together. Welcome back. I hope you've got some uh, interesting answers to those questions. I think uh, it's fairly obvious what everyone's first headline is likely to be. It's going to be something along the lines of locusts, crops destroyed by unprecedented invasion. I had to get the word unprecedented in because that seems to be the word of the moment when it comes to looking at COVID. And that might be a clue as to something that we could include in one of the other answers to the question that come. Uh, how about food shortages? Swarm leaves nothing in its path. People were going hungry. They didn't have anything to eat because everything that was out in the fields, the crops that they relied on, had been destroyed by the locusts. They had chomped everything. And there was nothing green or edible, uh, visible at all. And the third one that I got, and I don't know whether you notice this, is church suspended. Nothing to use for sacrifices. So priests face redundancy. I made that last bit up uh, because actually Joel has a message for them to tell them what to do. But what we see is the priests are not able to bring their sacrifices and offerings because there is no grain. And the livestock has died out because it has nothing to eat. And so uh, when it came to the temple worship, there were serious problems because there was nothing for them to use. So, our second question, what other little things can multiply and have a devastating effect on society and my life? Well, again, I guess the first thing most of you will have put for that is something like coronavirus. Let's face it, it's a tiny little thing. We can't even see it. But it's multiplied, it's infected people, and it's had a devastating effect on our society. There are many other things. Uh, you, you can think of a little spark that turns into a forest fire like they've been having in certain parts of the world in recent months. Uh, you can probably think of many other things that start small, seemingly insignificant, but they grow and they have a massive effect. Sometimes that could be just a simple piece of gossip where somebody says something unguarded about somebody else, it's picked up the wrong way and passed on and passed on and passed on. And it becomes something devastating because it can destroy the reputation of a person. And maybe it wasn't even meant in that way when it was said. But there's a danger if we start to get involved in something like that. In my life? Well... What about things like bad habits? What about things like telling lies? One lie tends to lead to another, leads to another. What about making excuses? We very good at doing that. I'm very good at doing that. Um, doing things that I know are not really the best, but I excuse them. It's time to treat myself. It's, it, it's perfectly okay. But then the excuses start to excuse more serious things and the bad habits grow and my life is affected and maybe devastated by the effects of things that start small and grow uh, and have such a serious effect. Third question was who is Joel addressing and what is he calling them to do? Well, we can see, can't we, in verse 5, he says, Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. 
Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. We don't know whether there was a, a, a problem with drunkenness in Joel's day. He does address the drunkards, but he addresses all who drink. And the reality is that in that society, uh, wine was drunk by everybody. He goes on to talk about the farmers and the vine growers. In verse 11, he tells them to despair and to wail, to grieve, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. I imagine that's what they were doing anyway, because they had seen their livelihood disappear in the mouths of the locusts. And then he talks to the priests, uh, and that's in verse 13. And he says, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Here were the priests who had nothing to offer uh, in terms of sacrifice, nothing to eat. It's all very well for Joel to tell them to fast, isn't it? I don't think they could have had much choice in that. But what he says is proclaim a holy fast. In other words, don't just sit there not able to eat. Use this time to seek God. And he says, call all the elders together. All who live in the land, call them to the house of the, uh, the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. As Christians, we have a responsibility to show people where they can find help to talk to them about how even in times of crisis god is there to hear them and to meet their needs and to care for them but these priests need needed to be told they were clearly devastated by what had happened but just weren't thinking that it was their responsibility as spiritual men to point others towards God and to seek God's face and to find out what God would have them to do in these difficult circumstances. And it goes on in verse 15, Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. And this is where Joel starts to go on to talk about another dramatic day obviously the day the locusts came and the period in which they devastated the land was one thing but joel now starts to talk about the day of the lord this is a phrase that will come up five times in this short book uh, and this is the first mention of it the day of the lord is near it will come like destruction from the almighty where had the locusts come from one of the things about the book of Joel is we don't know what the cause of the locust swarm was. So there are times in the Bible when God brings a disaster on his people and it's very clearly a punishment for their waywardness, for them neglecting him. Times when they were taken into exile, uh, times when they were defeated in battle all forms of God's judgment for their disobedience. In here, we don't see Joel saying, these locusts have come because you've not been the people that you ought to be. Even though they don't know why the locusts have come, Joel's message is, seek God. And that's a message that we can take away. It doesn't matter what kind of disaster we may face, whether it's a big one that's affecting the whole of society or whether it's something personal that seems to be only affecting us or a few people alongside us. The message is seek God. Declare a holy fast. 
Use that time to ask God what he would have you to do. And here he is in verse 19. After he's gone through all the uh, all the effects of the devastating uh, plague of locusts, he says to you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. But he says, to you, Lord, I call. Who's your go-to friend when things go wrong? Maybe there are humans, friends that you have here that you can go to you can share with you can talk to they can pray with you but ultimately the person we turn to in any time of disaster is God himself because he's the one who uh, we need to seek his face no matter what circumstances we may be in let's say a prayer heavenly father we thank you for Joel's message in the midst of a, a national disaster, that it was that people should seek your face. Lord, even the priests had to hear that message. And there are times when we as Christians do forget. Remind us, Lord, that it's our responsibility to seek you and to encourage others to call upon you because you care for each of us help us as we go through this week to live for you we ask it in jesus name amen well thanks for joining us for roots and shoots this week next week we'll go on to look a little bit further into the next chapter of the book of joel have a great week <laughs>